process and the management, innovation process and management. So that's something that's uh, uh, another key area that I focus on. In terms of sectors, I've, um, the, the work is, is, is cuts, cuts across quite a few of them. So you know, retail, uh, travel, hospitality, financial services, fintech, um, TMT, uh, but both from a business to consumer, business to business, and also business to business to consumer white label type solutions. And clients typically, I think I mentioned before, you know, private equity and venture capital investment firms, but also large global corporates. Um, I work with professional services firms as well um, who offer digital solutions, digital commerce solutions, and I help them improve their internal capabilities, um, the sort of services they offer and, and how they offer them as well. Um, and, and also with digital agencies as well too, again, helping them and. Uh, how, 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 they, how they interact with their clients and, um, and how they integrate their processes with you know, their clients' processes, particularly around you know, creative engineering, bringing them together, working effectively and efficiently. Um, past, past life, a CTO, CIO group level um, since about 2005, primarily in the travel and uh, hospitality, um, so hotels. Um, and then past lives before then, um, as a technology executive across multiple sectors um, and as you can hear I have an Australian accent. I arrived here in 2002 and my, my first job here was a, a cloud service provider CTO so quite a fair bit of experience actually running cloud services as well which has served me well with other work that I've done elsewhere. So that's, that's enough about me. So let's set the scene uh, regarding Ava's budget. So in 2011 Avis Budget in the US, Avis Budget Group, acquired Avis Europe. Now, Avis Europe as a business consisted of both the Avis brand and the budget brand across all of Europe, um, multiple markets as corporate markets and other markets operating as, as, as in a franchise type of arrangement. And what Avis Budget um, US saw was you know, clear opportunities here um, to Number one, to integrate, to integrate that uh, Avis Europe business into the overall group itself. Um, very importantly, to move from you know, models that I think a lot of you are quite familiar with, I'm sure, moving from a federated model where each of the, you know, typically even each of the brands within each of the European markets had its own operations, its own IT, its own marketing, its own sales, uh, own finance, and, and move that from a federated uh, operating model to uh, a centralised model with the Avis Budget headquarters in the UK acting as the, as the, as the hub, central office, and then having specific country um, you know, uh, functions running, but in a, a, a much uh, diminished, diminished um, scope though. And really importantly, um, uh, quite a significant opportunity to improve the commercial performance of the uh, Avis Budget uh, business across, across Europe together with um, the level of customer service. So they were okay, but certainly not stellar, not anything that the group was particularly happy with, and they could see there was clear gaps there um, that allow, would allow them to, to, to improve on both of those aspects. So uh, a game-changing opportunity. In 2012, um, a, a, a mere-wide business transformation uh, exercise was initiated. So this is across all functional areas. Uh, and you know, a key part of that, obviously, being this move from a federated to a centralised business model, an operating model. Um, but uh, when, when they looked at the, let's call it the, the digital landscape, it was very big, huge. Uh, both Avis and budget brands across all the markets had websites, mobile websites, mobile apps, iOS, Android, Windows, BlackBerry. It was all there, um, but not really performing as well as they would have, would have liked. And with certain benchmarking exercises, it was clear that there was room, room for improvement here. So clearly a real opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to transform from a digital perspective, from a digital um, uh, business perspective. So the main areas that were identified were you know, rationalising, and streamlining, uh, particularly the, I, the IT, the marketing, and then more broadly the commercial side. The, the marketing team was part of the commercial, the commercial team. 
and really importantly, transforming the customer experience for both of the brands as well, both Avis and Budget. And uh, I think one of the, the popular terms of our chief commercial officer at the time, who had actually came out of the, uh, the FMCG space, you know, unusual to come out of that space, but he, what he wanted to see was what he called them, you know, moments of magic. Moments of magic for the customer uh, across all the channels and across all of the touch points. And, you know, this is something that was reinforced with, with everybody across all the functional areas. And, you know, certainly with a, a large organisation trying to shift digitally, really important to have a few key principles that everyone keeps in mind, helps them stay focused and helps them make better decisions without having to, to go up the line again to say, you know, what, what, what should I prioritise here? What should I do? So this moment of magic was, a, was an important element. So from a commercial perspective, the key objectives... Um, the key objectives that, um, that were agreed upon, that we focused on was, you know, firstly looking at increasing customer retention, re you know, reducing the churn, um, making sure that, you know, like doing the right things to ensure more lo loyalty from customers. And uh, in particular with the, Avis, with the Avis brand, had the loyalty, uh, the, the loyalty system in place um, with the Avis preferred. And again, it was clear that there was, there was you know, room for improvement there. Other area was you know, just bringing more customers, more visitors, but real customers to the digital sites across the digital properties, you know, be it web, mobile, web, mobile apps. Bring more visitors. Really importantly, improve the digital sales conversion. Uh, really important and, uh, point, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, that element there and hopefully it, it resonates with, with quite a few of you. Um, and, and lastly, just you know, being able to sell more, sell more things, more relevant, valuable things to customers with each purchase. So, you know, increase the, uh, you know, the, the AOV, the, uh, the average order value. So, th these are really the key commercial objectives. So, first stage of the transformation. First up, very much a, a focus on you know deep research, really understanding, you know, who is the Avis customer, who is the budget customer. Um, you know, What's the business? Who's, you know, who, who's in the business? What does the business do? What is it about? Then the wider ecosystem, the drivers, the forces. Um, so very deep research, but still done quite quickly though at the same time. So intense activity um, and exciting for everyone at the same time. Um, so secondly, you know, the formulation of the strategy itself. So. Uh, the goal there was, you know, coming up with a solid strategy where, you know, one plus one does actually turn into three, <laughs> uh, where you have a coherent strategy that's, you know, realistic, actionable, um, with, without it just being created from a set of sales targets for the next 12 and 24 months and saying, that's my strategy. So something that actually had, you know, what are we going to do? When are we going to do it? There's a strategic plan behind it as well. So big focus for us. And, some key elements of that strategy um, were, you know, were, were, were proved out through early exercises, you know, proof, proof exercises, and uh, and I think that's a good, that's a very that's a very good approach and gives comfort levels and knowledge and keeps and helps with the focus as well. Uh, and then the business case, very much customer centric, commercially focused, but really important, data driven. The business case, not you know, not a business case effectively on the on the back of a napkin <laughs> or on an A4 sheet, but really thought through, hard look at the data, looking across um, both brands, you know, at, at obviously um, you know, a mere level, compare with what the, the, the US parent is doing, do some internal benchmarking, do external benchmarking, and then start diving into the segments, the sub-segments, um, and looking not just at direct-to-consumer, but looking at the wholesale business and, um, and, and really getting a holistic and, and deep, a deep view and using that then to, to build out a you know, bottom-up business case, a bottom-up from real data. Um, and then a planning, so very much a multifunctional, multifunctional, multi-departmental effort, working together, closely together, all aspects, uh, you know, commercial, uh, the, the marketing side, the IT side, operations, really important, finance, HR involved, legal, everybody um, to, to, to come up with a holistic plan, a holistic plan 
in the very early stages and look at things from both group level, brand level, uh, country level as well, but always ensuring that we've, you know, there's live, active alignment with the global picture as well, making sure that the, the, um, the parent company is included, aware, understands. They may not agree with everything, but yeah, this is a learning exercise for everybody. You learn, you research, and then um, it ensures that there's, there's, there's true alignment and no surprises for anybody either. Um, and, and last of all, really important was to, to show in early stages, you know, demonstrate what is the art of the possible. And it was certainly, that was something that we kept very high in mind. And even though a lot of what we planned to do with the digital transformation of those budget were things they, they had never done, and frankly, most of the car rental industry had not done uh, at the time, we found ways to demonstrate those things, you know, build solutions um, that hooked in all the way to the mainframe systems that that were built in the 1970s, um, but show capabilities that built on that and did something that was truly, um, um, you know, tr tr truly different, differentiating for the customer, but also for the business itself too. Um, and we'll go through some examples on that. So one of the key areas was, was the brands, the Avison budget brands. So it was clear from the research and frankly even the company itself, the staff themselves knew that Avison budget as brands, you know, over time started blurring. You know, what did they represent as a brand? Um, you know, what values and principles, and you know, commoditized. Not a lot of clarity even internally. You know, what, what do we mean? What do we stand for as Avis? What do we stand for as budget? So there was very clear agreement onto, um, and actually they they worked closely with a brand strategy agency to help them go through that process. And it was uh, it was very interesting and very exciting actually. And and to see the energy levels come up across the whole business, to get that clarity and then say, okay, let's map that now to what does that mean for the digital customer experience? You know, what is that target experience? And what can we do to ensure that that digital experience is, is that and is consistent across all the touch points, um, including the, the rental stations themselves as well, when they walk into the store, when they see an advertisement somewhere, do they get the same feeling, the same uh, messages? permeating through. So I've actually summarized the, 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 and you can see the difference between the brands. So Avis very much, you know, luxurious, personalized, you know, exclusive, proactive, and, and attentive. Budget, a different spin. You know, budget before was more about, uh, you know, the value brand, but they, again, switched budget a bit, more about the fun brand, um, you know, simple, clear, very flexible, and, and responsive at the same time. And, uh, it, again, very simple uh, principles here, but again, helping to focus and keep, keep the effort uh, aligned with where we, you know, where we where agreed we need to go to. So in terms of the actual digital business solution itself, uh, principles that were agreed upon very early in the process, uh, you know, for the platform itself, the platform was always going to be about uh, competitive differentiation, you know, an enabler of competitive differentiation and innovation, but just not rap, you know, rapid innovation in particular. Um, there were quite a number of uh, important elements uh, with the platform itself, but you know, we, we can crystallise it down to the two key areas, the e-commerce engine itself and the content management system and content platform, uh, which in the final analysis we, you know, we, we went through a, an RFI process and we decided on Magnolia. Uh, it, it certainly met all the objectives. So Magnolia was the choice, the choice there. There were other elements later that were introduced like social listening and monitoring solutions uh, together with um, improved digital marketing solutions together with uh, a loyalty solution as well, uh, a more capable loyalty solution. Other important thing was partnering, you know, working with vendors and partners. Uh, and again, there's the principles we, we, we keep reinforcing, keep tell it. we told all the vendor candidates, I said, you know, you need to prove that you're capable, that you're, yeah, you're engaged, so you're talking to us, you're invested. It doesn't mean that they have to put money, but it means they invest time, they invest effort to show that they care and that they're proactive. So for instance, they, they, they heard that you know, we want to do something, they proactively built some demos, end-to-end -end demos to show us the art of the possible, for example. So um, around the, the agility piece, um, agility more in terms of the, the, the process that we used um, in, in actually, you know, 
implementing, rolling out the solution, very much taking a, you know, a lean and agile approach, uh, including things, to the RF, you know, things like the RFI and the RFP process itself. So even with some of these highly strategic elements, e-commerce engine and CMS itself, those RFIs were run very quickly, very quickly. We're talking you know, weeks, handfuls of weeks, not six months or nine months or 12 months, <laughs> but weeks. Um, and you know, clearly defined processes, you know, uh, support from the top level down, chief executives, and you know, an agreement and decisions made, timelines agreed, done. No uh, sitting on our hands and procrastinating. Important to move ahead. And last of all, experimentation and proof. So earlier when I spoke about the strategic piece around the strategy where we had proving exercises there, that concept of proving and doing experiments, trying things out, um, but very important and particularly around the technology mechanisms. And one key example there was proving that, for instance, the e-commerce engine will integrate well with the content management system, content platform, and it will support those capabilities that the business is looking for. You know, uh, some of those new capabilities, and it might be things like, you know, can we pass certain parameters about the customer down the line? Will it be understood? Will it work properly? Will it scale? Um, if we need to make changes, can we actually experiment and prove to ourselves that we can easily add a new landing page, put in some new content, uh, take something and yeah, build it for UK first, some content, and then can we reuse that same approach now across the rest of the markets and can we do it quickly? So yeah, the experimentation. Um, but really important to prove out those, those technical uh, mechanisms. And particularly for Ava's budget group, I've mentioned those two elements there, but we had to make decisions around you know, what enterprise integration technology to use, for example. Uh, an enterprise service bus or something like that. There were other key areas we needed to focus on and given the legacy <laughs> systems and processes we had to deal with, um, we needed to be careful. And we couldn't assume something would just work. And with the questions, we prove it. We prove it to ourselves. And find out if there's a problem early so we can fix it. <laughs> We've got time to actually fix it. So with delivering the actual digital capability, the platform itself, some key areas, the customer experience itself, uh, we used a design thinking approach, worked, worked with an agency, um, lots of regular cross-functional team reviews in the, the design offices of the agency and a lot of debate and argument as well, but always with the view that we want something better uh, for, for, the end, for the end customer to come up with an experience that makes sense. And actually, we came up with a lot of design and workflow options and we tried a lot of these things with proper, proper user testing, um, and, you know, I think this is the opportunity for you to try different things and, and look, you know, where can we tweak what? Is it the choice of colours? Is, is it the layouts? Is it the workflow? They're, they're doing it on a laptop. They're doing it on a, um, uh, you know, on a Samsung phone, on an iPhone. Are they, they're doing it on a tablet. They're, um, they're doing it on a Galaxy tab, you know, actually going through every time and testing these things out. And you find out all those nice little surprises, which you know, something in principle should work, doesn't actually work in, in, in reality for, for whatever reason. So um, testing really important. Agile delivery um, worked really, really hard to, to, to integrate and to streamline that you know, very iterative delivery process, connecting the creative teams with the software teams and the release teams. And I'm sure many of you have, have, have are deal, probably dealing with it right now, but you know, especially when you've got the creative and the software and software engineering, is you know it's oil and water sometimes in terms of how they mix together. Um, so ensuring that there's clear understanding, clear alignment, and then you know adjusting the processes, particularly when you're dealing with an external agency, to get something that's uh, streamlined and doesn't create unnecessary re rework for you. Because the danger there obviously is that something that you thought was going to take this long ends up taking this long and creates pain and extra cost and, and so forth, and time, and time is everything. Um, from a content migration standpoint, um, very, very significant exercise. We're talking many tens of thousands of pages of content. At the same time, we've just had two brands that have reinvented themselves. So for instance, we already had websites across all these markets, and they 
made decisions that we're going to change the tone of voice. For example, <laughs> you know, we would go from an authoritarian voice in the German market to something that's a slightly warmer tone for that particular brand. And you know, how do you how do you actually migrate all of that content, get it across onto these new sites whilst the plane is still flying, right? You're trying to refuel and change engines while while, while you're moving. So it, it needed a lot of planning, a lot of formal um, uh, a lot of formal testing actually of processes and as you know, as much automation as possible. So we you know we, we did work with some external vendors who provided us with some very um, very clever tools that allowed us to automate a lot of that content migration. Um, but also highlight the areas that needed uh, a human being to actually read that text and say, you know, did that migration actually work? You know, can we validate that the language is right, that the wording is right, that it makes sense? Um, but you know, that, that was the difference of you know, having a handful of people working on it as, oppo you know, as opposed to having you know, 30 people working on it for you know, probably five times as long. And last of all, you know, process standardization. And I think the, the key area here I'm talking about is uh, processes around your content in particular. Paid a lot of attention to this area and ensuring that we moved from the solution before, which was bespoke CMSs, different ones for each brand, um, highly capable, you know, um, many pages of documentation, but not necessarily the sort of capabilities you would expect and always needing to involve the IT team every time the, the, the marketing team or the brand teams wanted to add some new content or change something. So, you know, very well-defined content approval uh, and publishing workflows. Where there was content, for instance, that had serious brand implications, and, you know, in principle, the branding team should definitely look at that content and approve it, the workflows would be mandatory for them. Other cases, it would be optional. And again, we were able to customise the, the workflows to do that. And really importantly, um, move from a space where we had you know, 200 people who could update content across all of Europe with very little auditing, no easy ability to roll things back. This was the, you know, this was the past to, you know, not 200, but having, you know, a couple of tens of people. Well-defined access, you know, fine granular access and knowing that, you know, what can be done at group level, what can be done at uh, brand level, can be done at market level and ensuring that that is the access they have. And if they make any changes, someone can actually go and check and see who made the change, when did they make it, make that? Um, you know, who, who authorised it? Was it okay? And if we need to change it for whatever reason, it's, it's easy to roll it back. But again, well-defined processes and a lot of training, formalised training, documentation, and, you know, champions set up both at group level, country level, brand level as well. Uh, and I think unless you do these things and explicitly handle these areas, well, you know, you, you're really leaving yourself to, to, to luck. So it pays to be very methodical and top-down uh, with this, and it certainly paid dividends. So just to give you a little bit of a sense, I've, I've, I've put together a couple of screenshots, well, a few screenshots here. So this is the, the, the brand portfolio. So this is the current um, Avis homepage at the moment. And I wish I had screenshots of the old, of the old version of the website because it's, 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 it's night and day difference. But, you know, a lot of um, much, much, much more use of, of high resolution imagery, but really importantly, you know, clear calls to action, you know, legible you know, text that I can, actually, I can actually read, you know, use of um, graphical icons and certainly more modern user interface uh, metaphors. This is the actual, uh, this is the current Spanish uh, website for Avis. Again, use of great imagery, but you know, it's, it's all about the booking, right? It's left and center and the calls to action are clear, really clear. Um, if we want to talk about inspiration, this is, this is off the current uh, Avis UK website. So we've got a page here, which is one of the inspiration pages, which is you know, Star Wars filming locations and intergalactic the road trip. And then you dive into this inspiration content and here you can explore. So, you know, there's tattoo and trekking in, uh, <laughs> in, in North Africa. And then, you know, road, road trips there, Tuscany, Lake Geneva. Uh, but now that the, the commercial teams have the tools, it's a pleasure for them to use, right? It's easy. It's easy for them. And it's not that immediate barrier of, oh, my God, I'm going to need to 
talk to five guys in IT to, just to scope this out, in three months we might see something and we've just lost the opportunity. You know, why can't I do it right now? You know, why can't we do it right now? Why can't we get that out in the next, next, next day or next couple of days? So, um, yeah, it's the ability to create landing pages for various purposes. Uh, and then switching back to the Spanish site, a little bit more uh, inspirational content there. Um, now, budget. This is the budget Spain site. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, budget's branding changed from that value to the more fun type brand. So you can see the imagery they're using there. And I remember the first uh, budget website that we had on the new platform with the new branding. Uh, it, was, it had, uh, you know, you just see the kids' legs up in the air with the, with the, with the, with the Wellington boots all coloured, you know, all very colourful and, again, fun, playful, and all of that permeating through the website and, 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 and all the other digital properties. So in terms of changing the, the, the business game, um, changing the game or changing the business game as I'm using it, what, one of the key areas I mentioned to you is social media. So even though we were in the process in 2013 of rolling out a uh, new platform, getting budget brand onto the new platform initially, and then Avis went uh, later. There was some strategic work done around social media and the opportunity around social media. And there was a lot of excitement around not just improving levels of customer service, but actually generating real incremental revenue through social media channels. And uh, I mean, the excitement was, 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 was so huge that we were asked, you know, can we get some social media type monitoring, listening solutions in place, get people trained up, have them using it with, I think we were given something like six or seven weeks to do it. So we went through an RFI process, RFI process, decision, approval, training, rollout, all done in less than a month. It was all done in a month. And we, we truly did have a social media, you know, as an active direct sales channel at that point in time. The, uh, I can't tell you the numbers, confidential, but um, what I can say to you is that the, you know, the, at uh, group executive level, they'd set sales targets to be hit in six months through social media channels, and they exceeded that target in month one. Now I set another stretch target above that one, and they hit 97% of that one within the next month. And, um, but again, a very engaged social media team, the people who came into that team had a lot of experience with Facebooks and so forth in the past, but they were phenomenally passionate about the brand. And one example I'll give you, uh, I actually saw the letter that was written in by, he's one of the reporters from The Sun, The Sun newspaper, so I'm sure you're aware of The, the Sun news pictorial uh, paper in the UK. And it was June, around the June time frame, and he and a number of his colleagues needed to go to a wedding. And the wedding, I think, was in Nice. They needed to leave from, I think they were living from Calais. That's right, I think they were living from Calais. And he did everything through social media, Twitter and Facebook. And the team was interacting with him. You know, they picked up on a couple of interesting messages coming through, interacted with him, and he just dealt with them through social media. They organised everything. Uh, comes the day to travel, the French airstrike hit. It was around June, right? The French airstrike we had then. So his flight's cancelled. Panic stations. He had, a whole, he had a whole troop of people needed to get to a wedding. And then he just pinged through Twitter and he knew the individual he dealt with before and they had cars organised for everybody in less than an hour and uh, double-checked that everything was available at the office and they were able to drive from Calais, get to Nice, get to the wedding on time and he... Yeah, I mean, the, the accolades were, were phenomenal. He says, I'm only going to recommend you guys to my, my colleagues and so forth. But again, this is just showing you the power of social media. Um, and in terms of high customer service levels, I, I know that even at that time we switched from, a, I think it was something uh, you know, like a guaranteed SLA of um, you know, 30, 30 days to respond to customer queries. And through escalation in social media, the guys were hitting less than 24 hours. You know, to, to, to resolve anything that was passed around social media, but very focused effort, strategic uh, policies in place, procedures, always learning, always continuously improving. Um, taken very, very seriously, extremely seriously. Group, country level, brand level as well. So just continuing on this theme of, you know, changing the game. So this... In 2014, the Avis brand, I mean, most people didn't know that Avis actually rents out luxury cars. They have 
They literally rent out hundreds of Porsche 911s just between Germany and the UK. Most people don't know that. And it was really easy for them just to create uh, a landing... Uh, actually, it's not, this is the home page uh, on, a, on a tablet. So this was the home page at the time, you know, sports car or supercar. You know, go and treat yourself. And it was all clicking. <laughs> Absolutely clicking. And, and if, if we look at some of the... Uh, you know, so once you actually go in there, there we go. You've got a Mercedes SL500 and you can see some of the concepts that you typically would see on, uh, on Amazon, you know. Other cars you might like. You might not go for the SL500. How about the 911 Carrera S or the Jaguar F-Type S or uh, a Jaguar F-Type you know, V6 and there were four-wheel drives as well too. But again, it's not something that you typically would have expected from a rental car company to do. More like a retailer. Um, and then, you know, we go into a little more detail here. And I, I remember showing this to some of my friends who were in investment banking, and they said, wow, I can actually rent a 911 from Heathrow, and you give me a little discount too anyway for, 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 two, for two days. But I said, absolutely, I'll do it. I actually want to take one for a test drive. I said, it's dead easy. Go, go, book it online. It's there. And, uh, again, in terms of changing the game, Avis in Europe has not advertised on TV for 60 years. And they made a decision as part of this whole transformation exercise um, to, to, to create a new ad. And that ad was aired during the World Cup, uh, during one of the matches that England played in. And it's still running now. I, I saw it again in the UK, I saw it three times this week on TV. And uh, look it up, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's all done in black and white. The car is not moving. The cars are not moving. It's all about you know, unlock the world so that they've got the... They've got the unlock, and you just see the lights flashing. But pull it up on, uh, you can see it on YouTube. Actually, I'll, I'll put the link up so you can, you can see it. It's a great ad. In the background, the music is Mary Poppins, the music from Mary Poppins. So it, it presses a lot of buttons, and it's, it, again, not something you would expect a car rental firm to do. And you, know, you, you wait until the end of the ad, then you see, bang, Avis. You don't even know it's Avis to begin with. You, know, you, see, a, you see a Porsche here overlooking a city. You see you know, an Italian scene, you see beaches in California and Australia, you see there's a shot in the Himalayas, in, um, not in the Himalayas, in Peru, I think. It's just, it was shot all around the world. And for the first time, for a long time, they actually brought back the Avis We Try Harder. Again, some, uh, some, some interesting elements there. And a very, very important focus on keeping that brand consistency, messaging, uh, imagery across websites, everything. So unlock the world on the apps, on the mobile web, websites here, in the stores themselves as well too. Um, important for both brands, but really important for the Abus brand in particular. Very brand conscious. So, you know, it, it paid to stay focused on it. So road ahead for car rental. So a little bit of prediction here from my side as well, but I think we, we're seeing some of the directions that car rental is going in. Car rental is still a, a good cash flow business and um, there's huge growth expected in the car rental. We, we do have interesting things with the ride hailing services like Uber and Lyft uh, in the US and I, I think we probably will see more deals, company type deals with these ride hailing um, uh, firms and uh, the classic example is Hertz and Lyft. Uh, Hertz is Again, as I said, Lyft is like Uber. They're not that different, very similar. Um, and they've got a deal where Hertz is actually providing them with cars. I think we're going to see more of these kind of interesting partnerships. Who knows, acquisitions. I, you know, there's any number of ways that the, I think it, it could go. Autonomous cars, we've heard about the Google car. I think we'll see a hell of a lot more about that. And, you know, where is personal mobility going to go in the next 10 to 15 years? Are we going to get to the point where, you know, you're sitting there and you can say, bang, I, I need a car now. So all the way from request, request, to delivery, to use it, to drop it off, all you know, driven through virtualized technologies and completely automated for you, that's probably where it's going to end up going. I can't be sure, but it seems as though that's, that's, that's where we're headed with the car rental industry. Um, and we will see mergers and acquisitions, and uh, I, I think we will. What form will it take? Let's, let's, let's wait and see. If we expand a little bit further outside of car rental, we look more broadly in travel and hospitality. Um, there was a very interesting study done by IBM uh, around 2011, 2012, I think it was. And they looked at the whole travel ecosystem, very deep study, and they, what they called it was the travel distribution dilemma. And saying that you know, the travel ecosystem, this includes hospitality as well, right? It's, it's a whole travel leisure. 
uh, still struggles to satisfy you know, people's very specific, specific needs. And it still takes far too long, either as a, as a, a leisure or a business tra traveller, to you know, research, shop, book. You know, the, the statistics there they're showing, you know, a leisure travellers, um, you know, more than, you know, over 50% of leisure travellers, probably 55% of leisure travellers, and this was done in 2010, this has not changed much. Um, spending, you know, three hours or more researching, uh, researching and, and booking together, and some people are taking eight hours plus. Some element of that is probably enjoyment, <laughs> to, I would say, but I'd say it's, pro it's more painful for me, I, I think, you know, when you're trying to organise your holiday, your flight, your flight, your hotel, your rental car, your destination services, what, what you want to do. And, and, and I, think, um, I think part of the reason is that we probably focus far too much on the price and the, how we package things up, how we sell them, how we distribute them. We think the customers are probably more price sensitive than what they actually are. And what they're really looking more, probably looking more for is value as opposed to the price itself. And value is saying, okay, give me a really cheap price, but geez, I'm not getting much value here. This is a terrible place. So it's like, am I getting good value for what you're offering me? I want a luxury offering, but I want it at a good price, at a reasonable price. So that balance between price and value, I think, is, is an interesting one. And the key issue, uh, and this is what uh, the study also mentioned, was that argument over, you know, who owns the customer and the data. So, you know, the travel supplier says, a hotel, an airline, uh, you know, car rental firm says, well, hang on. They, it, they came to, you know, it's, we're providing the actual service. So we own the customer, we own the customer data. And then the, uh, the reseller, you know, the OTA, um, travel agent says, well, hang on a sec, I'm, I'm the one who actually did the business here. I own it. Well, actually, I, I think in, neither, neither of them own the customer or the customer data. The customer owns it. Um, and, but I think we, we're still at loggerheads with that because we have a travel ecosystem that's less likely to to band together and create a complete picture. The airline knows a lot about the customer. They know what your meal preferences are, but they don't know the data that the online travel <coughs> agency knows. So no one has the complete picture. So they can't offer something really compelling, compelling and uh, priced accordingly at the right point in time to that person through you know, digital marketing or, or so forth, if someone's actually shopping on their website. So uh, th this is still an issue. Um, and I think that's why we still see a continual proliferation of meta search engines and booking engines and so forth because no one's cracked this nut yet. I think uh, if we do, I think a lot of us will be happy. Um, and then hospitality itself, uh, more, more, more broadly, I think there's this continuing focus, much more intense focus on the personalization of the guest experience. And one of the key areas, and I, I'd certainly in my discussions, is a lot more work around that you know, increased standardization um, around processes, the operational processes, but also standardization around the platforms and tools. And some of the key drivers around that obviously is cost. You reduce the cost, that means you're increasing your margins. But really importantly, it means for your staff, the staff who are actually um, servicing those customers, they spend less time worrying about the process because it's standardized, it works well, it's transparent, and they spend more time with the guest paying attention to the guest and making sure that every interaction they have with that guest is special in itself and they're customising the service on the spot at the time. But if that poor staff member is fighting with a process which works slightly differently in this hotel in that city, part of the city and the other one is slightly different and they've moved, uh, another country it's slightly different and then reporting and you, know, you do your revenue recognition, you look at your KPIs and how do you do a like for like comparison, you know, it, it, there's lots of reasons why it's good to, to, to have the standardization and interesting that you have that dichotomy of you know I can standardize but that allows me then to personalize the service but that's that's actually quite true um, and really interesting then you know similar to what I said before with Ava's budget having a you know a platform for you know uh, for rapid innovation and for you know, competitive differentiation allows you then to more quickly and easily introduce new ideas, concepts, new innovations. You know, in terms of the product you offer, the service, uh, how you offer it, and and also how you internally do it as well. How do you, you know, improve your own internal processes? And last of all, um, I, I mean, I I think we're seeing some elements of it. I think that personalization, which is more to do with the interaction with the customer, is going to extend and is starting to extend into the actual uh, properties themselves of so the, the room layout. 
the, uh, you know, the moods, the scents, um, you know, the actual content, the furniture and so forth. And you know, depending on that person's, you know, whether it's a, a leisure or business context, you know, someone's you know, got a first wedding anniversary coming up, a 10th, a 15th. You know, why can't the mood and the lighting and everything be customised? And why, why do we just have to stick to room numbers, for instance, which are quite impersonal? You, know, you go to hotels with the rooms that actually have a, a name and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a character of sorts. That display could actually be a digital one. And I've seen some very high resolution type displays that are used in supermarkets, for example, where you see automatic update, beautiful imagery and so forth. Why couldn't that be done in a, in, in a hotel context? And, and eventually a lot of... This manual personalization, I think, with improved technologies, with obviously the price point is coming down, so it's not too expensive. There's a, there's a decent return on investment there. We will see that a lot of this personalization will actually automate itself because the technology will allow you to do that. Um, and I, 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 very quickly, I, I wanted to just broaden it a little bit further from the hospital and look at the sharing economy. And I know, you know, we, we talk about Airbnb and uh, Unders, that, that's, that's your name, we were speaking about Airbnb before in our, in our personal experiences with it. And, you know, is it a competitor? And I think the commentary out there is, well, it depends on the positioning of your hotel. And, again, and the other thinking is, well, typically Airbnb is, is more of a competitive issue at, at the lower price point. But, you know, we're seeing a lot more luxury sharing property out there now. So that's, it's starting to creep up there. But you know, sharing is not for everybody either. And I, I've actually got an example here from Home Away, who actually hit, you know combats this head on. And you know, you look at this image. You know, it's your vacation. Why share it? Um, see the video for it. It is absolutely hilarious. But it's a very engaging and interesting way for them. And you know, having said that, you know, they are about vacation homes. But they're saying we do not share. There is no sharing. So and it doesn't mean that sharing is in not just sharing where someone is with you, but you know, after they leave as well. You know, they, they leave a few. Uh, Presence, <laughs> if, 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 if you know what I mean. So it's that whole notion. Some people are perfectly fine with it. Others are like, no, nah, no. Nah, this is our one holiday we take this year. It's got to be special. It's got to be personal. It needs to be memorable for all the right reasons, not because we don't ever want to go back to that place and that particular hotel again or property. So um, I, I would just very briefly talk about you know, we talk about innovation all the time, and innovation is, is this focus on innovation is more about creativity, finding new ways, new things to do, and in and, and particular for travel and hospitality, looking at other areas and sectors that are kind of related. You know, fashion has a certainly a, uh, an interesting, I think, relationship with, um, with, with travel and hospitality. And I was reading the Sunday Times recently in February, and there was a style magazine they had in there, a very interesting interview with Donatella Versace. But she was talking about, you know, the, the, the see now, buy now generation, you know, that need for immediacy. I want it now. I, you know, you've shown me something. Why aren't you offering that product? You know, you, you've, you've sent me that email, right, to tell me that you're offering that product and service. Why isn't it available yet? Oh, so yeah, we, yeah, we've loaded it there, but it's not loaded on here. A lot of us, I know, have solved that problem, but you know that still persists in a way. But also, you know, your products and so forth. You know, you you're running seasons. You might do summer or winter. You know, those lines are blurring. And, and this is what Donna Teller's alluding to, saying, you know, forget forget the summer and winter collection. That's all gone now. You know, the the Zara's of this world, the Inditex, so forth. Of they, they certainly changed the game there. The ASOSs. Um, the other important one, though, is this, this notion of the partnering. You mentioned, remember before I mentioned about the partnering, the importance of partnering. And what she finds unbelievable, she says, you know, I would never imagined in the past that, you know, Amani and Gianni Versace, you know, would, would have worked together on something, a collection. They were absolute competitors. But here they are now, these brands. They work together. They produce something new and fresh they could never have done by themselves. But they know that the end customer actually appreciates both brands and so you've done something quite clever and cool here um, together that um, clearly you couldn't have done before and you know we associate you with it and it's actually something quite compelling. Um, so I think again that, that message is around you know the speed, uh, the flexibility and you know creative partnering <laughs> um, and you know that, that travel distribution dilemma Frankly, the only way that'll actually get solved is if we actually had the whole travel ecosystem working more collaborative together and sharing data, pooling data. Is that going to happen? I don't know. Uh, I think some of us are quite sceptical about it, but I think someone's going to be bold 
uh, and drive some initiatives around that, and we may see some interesting improvement there, and the end customer experience will be much better. Internet of Things, just a quick quote here from Apple co-founder, uh, Steve Wozniak. He's saying that the talk is, is definitely way ahead of the reality around Internet of Things, that it is something that is, you know, we're not going to see every single object in our rooms, in our hotels and properties hooked up to the Internet. That's not going to happen overnight. He you know, says it's going to be a, it's a very gradual thing and he, he, he gives the analogy of apps, you know, one app at a time. So within the hotel industry, certainly in the rental car, you know, I, I spend a, a lot of time with the Avis budget team on their IoT strategy and, and initiatives around a connected car. Very important to them, but I think very important for the hotel industry in particular, you know, because IoT, Internet of Things is really about having adaptive environments that adapt to your needs and wants in your particular context. And I, I think, you know, the hotel is, is one of the most best controlled environments. So I think huge opportunity and definitely worth experimenting in if you're, if you're not already, and, and learning. To learn doesn't have to be a costly exercise. And then where it makes sense and the, and the, uh, the economies and costs make sense, um, then you can actually implement something. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, feel free to come and grab me if, you, if you've got any questions at all after the talk, uh, or, or send me an email as well too. But a pleasure to speak to all of you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.